not only did he have a relationship with the government, but he had a mole in the FBI. In this world, you look out for number one. If you, if any people, take that oath to the grave. These guys are on the streets, so they're involved in, in hustling. All right, welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. We are very, very fortunate to have an OG from the American Dope game like few others. Uh, you might know him by the name Boston George. It's George Young. Uh, had a movie made about his life back in the early 2000s, the movie Blow with Johnny Depp playing a character that was uh, inspired uh, written about the life of George Young, who who really uh, was the uh, the founder, was the uh, catalyst behind the American Coke boom of the 1970s. He invented the market, so to speak, uh, on the West Coast of the United States, and then it spread like wildfire. Uh, George Young, the original gangster when it came to the American dope trade. Thank you so much for coming into the OG podcast and, and, and sitting here and chopping it up with us. Glad to be here in the Motor City. Yep. So uh, I'm Scott Bernstein, along with uh, my co-host, Jimmy Buccellato. Yo. And uh, our producer extraordinaire, Roberto Borchain. It is an honor to be here. And uh, this <laughs> yes. is, you know, we have George in studio. We are incredibly honored and privileged to be able to pick his brain about his, you know, he's lived probably 100 movie scripts. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that his life is even crazier than what we saw in the uh, excellent film Blow that was helmed by Ted Demi, our, uh, R.I.P. Uh, Ted. Uh, that was his last film, and, and, and it was really a masterpiece. Uh, it's the Goodfellas of drug movies, um, and it just has so much rewatchability. So that has really kind of embedded George uh, as an icon, uh, not just, you know, in American true crime filmmaking, but in, you know, American underworld lore uh overall so let's 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 dive in george uh kind of let's, let's let's start from the beginning um they call you boston george because you you come from Way, uh, weymouth massachusetts weymouth massachusetts was 20 miles south of boston in the suburbs it was like happy days and there were no drugs no crime no guns no violence nothing okay and I attempted several colleges, and on one day, at Christmas vacation, some Christmas break, Tuner and I decided to hell with college because if you graduated from college in the in the sixties, you made ten thousand dollars a year, and if you were a blue collar worker, you made five thousand, and you know. Bob Dylan said, I ain't going to work on Maggie's farm no more. And so Tuner and I secured a little sports car, and we drove. We were so dumb, we drove across the country in the winter after Christmas. And Tuna, for the for, uh, listeners, Tuna was the, the big... Uh, oh, Hulk. Yeah, the, the, the hulking right-hand man of the Johnny Depp character in the film. Uh, he was played by the actor Ethan Supley. And uh, he was a, uh, you know, a, a big boned, uh, gregarious, um, a thin, yeah, very uh, uh, affable. Would, would you say that the, the portrayal that you saw in the film was accurate to the way the tuna really was? Yeah, it was great. So go on. You know, tuna was the original John Belushi. <laughs> and the reason we really left college is because tuna was going to Colorado School of Mines and and he took his clothes off and walked in a girl's sorority house. And so he was out of college. And uh, after a couple of years of college, I became bored. And I decided to major at the University of Tennessee in a, a bar called the Wild Mouse. And so I was basically out and done. There was one last place to go, California. And we bought a little TR3 sports car and we drove out there. And we ended up in Belmont Shores in Long Beach, California, because I was still wanted to go to college. And I figured, well, it's free here out there in California. We can, you know, I'll go to Long Beach State. And we started looking for a little place on the beach to live. It was a beach town, a college town. We were driving by, and there was a sign for rent, and it was a duplex, and these girls were up on a balcony, and 
they looked down at us and said, hey, you guys going to rent down there? And I said, yeah. And they said, where are you from? And I'm like, nobody knew where the hell Weymouth was. You know, Weymouth, Massachusetts. And they said, I said, Boston. And they said, uh, what's your name? I said, George. And I said, come on up, Boston, George. Have some wine smoke a joint. <laughs> and that was Oh, I got them. And then the rest is history. And they were all stewardess, right? Yeah. That's what they say in the film. Uh, John Johnny Depp says, uh, I met a thousand girls that first day, and uh, 90% of them were uh, airline uh, stewardess. They were 3,000 airline stewardesses that lived in Manhattan Beach. And they would that would uh, prove to be very useful right. in your... As so you became I an entrepreneur. changed my major from marketing to fornication. <laughs> <laughs> right. With all A's, right? Yeah. 4.0. Wow. <laughs> he hit the books pretty hard, guys. <laughs> right. Right. So so then how? what's your first taste of, um, initially you start with marijuana smuggling, correct? And, that, and that's where the, the and, flight attendants come And George play. kind of, am I right, you kind of define yourself more as an outlaw than a gangster. He's more of kind of like a, uh, you know, a Desperado. narcotics pirate. Desperado. Well, the difference between a criminal and an outlaw is that a criminal breaks the law for money and an outlaw breaks the law to define himself. In That's other good. words, he's a self centered, arrogant, egotistical son of a bitch and he's a show off. Can't make this kind of stuff up. This is this is the the the, the oracle, the sage, the wisdom coming from this man is uh, just emanating through the studio. That's just because I gave you a hundred dollars. So, kind of talk about well, when you started, kind of uh, started your 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 empire started very small, started moving just you know small amounts of marijuana. Am I right? Right. <laughs> My boyhood buddy, who I grew up with in Weymouth, and uh, he went to the University of Massachusetts. Dooley? Is it Dooley? No. They just called him Dooley in the film. No, Dooley was another guy. Okay. But Frank was majoring in restaurant management and. He worked at the Mark Hopkins in San Francisco for the summer as part of his, his, you know, curriculum. And he stopped by Manhattan Beach, which is, you know, to the south, of, and okay, and to say goodbye, I'll see you next year, whatever. And I had a bowl, a fish bowl full of pot in the living room. He said, where'd you get all that pot? And I said, you can buy it right here on the beach, Frank. I said, it's cheap. And he said, how much do you buy it for? And I said, like $30, $40 a kilo. Wow. And, and he said, <laughs> he said, you know how much that cost back in the University of Massachusetts? And he said, three to $400 a kilo. And I said, you know what, Frank? I said, suppose I a light, a light bulb went off in your head. here <laughs> and I'm bringing it back there to you, and we'll make a lot of money. That's how it all started. He started driving it, right? Yeah, in motorhomes, Winnebago's. And how long did that last? It lasted a long time because I used the same con- concept with cocaine too. To get no, I'm saying, how long did it go? How long did it was the period when you were driving it to when you started flying it? Well, the period lasted like two years, and we were making a lot of money. Um, I mean, which was considered a lot of money in those days. I mean, thousands of dollars. But I became bored, conceived this idea. I said, why don't we go to Mexico and get our own pot? And they said, how the hell will we get it out of there? And I said, we'll fly it. And they said, you don't have a license. I said, I don't care. We'll get a plane. I said, well, we, 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 we get a, I said, we'll steal one. And so I convinced these guys from University of Massachusetts that were making a lot of money already to get out of the Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And... I didn't speak Spanish. That's one of the best scenes in the film, too, where they all go down there and they're all looking to try to find someone that can hook them up with marijuana, and they're and they're all asking different people. And then the uh, the, the the Derek for real character, whose real name was a Richard Barillo, is that uh-huh. correct? He's running around trying to like he's a hairdresser, and in the film, he's like instead of looking for marijuana, he's taking a guy and like saying, "Oh, you'd have a better haircut if it was this way instead of that way." So it was one of my favorite uh, uh, scenes in the film. Go ahead, George. I, I digress. About the Second week, my idea was suddenly, you know, a total failure to them. They would started to look at me in the in the bar. We used to go to the Oceano Bar and, and have beer and whatever and drink and overlook Banderas Bay and Puerto Vallarta. And 
we couldn't even find a joint. <laughs> and I said, we're leaving tomorrow. My ego suddenly vaporized, and I didn't know what the hell to say. Suddenly, you could see out the, the door of the bar, the street, it was close by and everything, and old yellow Volkswagen pulled up with flowers painted on it, and out got this girl, and she had yellow hair to match the Volkswagen. Like She walked right up to the table, and she said, hi, my name is Linda. And I said, sit down. She said, you know what? She said, I've been watching you guys for a couple of weeks now. You've asked everybody in this town except the police chief for pot. And she said, you need to be saved. And I said, save us. And she said, I live with one of the biggest pot connections in this whole area. And she said, get in the car, I'll take you there right now. And so she took me there. And he was the son of a Mexican general. And he had sport fishermen boats and he had the movement for all the pot on the mountains and this and that. And he said, how much do you want? I said, all of it. And he said, how are you gonna get out of here? I said, I'll fly it out. He said, you have a plane? I said, yeah. And I lied. First time I ever lied in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and everything went well. We left, we went back to the States and these guys started pressuring me again, Frank and the rest of them. You're crazy, where are we gonna get a plane? I said, we'll steal it. And I said, who's gonna fly it? And I said, I'll take some quick lessons and I'll fly the son of a bitch. So you had, said, you had never <laughs> taken a flying lesson before? You, you like boned up on it before you started stealing? Yeah, a little bit. And the guy who taught me, this old man, up at Sonoma Sky Park in California, he, his name was George, too, ironically, and he, he said, I didn't have an instrument rating, and he said, you're only as good as sundown, George. <laughs> and the first trip coming up the Baja, the sun, sun was starting to set. I asked God to help me. And he got me there, it was dry like beds, and I landed and unloaded. And after that, it was all downhill, or uphill. <laughs> wow. So you landed in Long Beach, and and then you were you were still transferring. No, we didn't land in Long Beach. We landed out in dry lake beds out by Palm Springs. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, that okay. That's okay. Yeah. And then you were still transporting it to Boston by motorhomes. Motorhome. Okay. So at that point, were um, was the word on the street in Boston that you were one of the key suppliers, or was it still uh, you were? People just didn't ask that kind of question as long as it was available. We just kept it all secret. I see. When you live outside the law, it's a good thing that keep everybody doesn't know who the <laughs> right, hell you smart. are, right? <laughs> right. You know, you, when right, they do start right. to know who you are is when you have problems. Right. That's when all the problems start. Right. Okay. Right. So at what point? Um, it's like, trust everyone in life, but don't trust the devil inside of them. So what point do things start to go south with uh, marijuana smuggling? You took a case out of Chicago, is that correct? I post, posted bond, I, I jumped bail. And I was gone for a couple of years. And finally when the, the, my mother turned me in. Yeah, that's what the, the, the yeah. film depicted. <laughs> right. the, yeah, and, and the character that the, yeah. the Rachel, <laughs> Rachel Griffiths, uh, I think from Six Feet Under, played your mother in the movie. And I, I thought she was just so compelling in that role. I thought she probably deserved an Oscar nomination. She didn't get it. But how accurate was the portrayal of your mother? Exactly. It was just, it was just like her? Yeah. I mean, to the point where she, she turned her own son in to the government. Right. Because, and, Ray Liotta, and Ray Liotta played your father. Because you have to... I never held anything against my mother for that. Because we lived in a world where on Abigail Adams Circle in Weymouth, Massachusetts, it wasn't every day that the FBI came to people's houses and said, well, you know, we'll look at your son. I mean, in the film, it seemed like she was embarrassed by it. That it she, she was totally humiliated and told me when I got out that I'd ruined her entire life. And it's true, I did. So what, what federal penitentiary did you serve your time in? I didn't. I went to um, a medium in Danbury, Connecticut. And in the film, the, the, the famous line is, I went into 
prison with a bachelor's in marijuana and I graduated prison, left prison with a graduate degree in cocaine. Right, but ironically, the one person out of hundreds and hundreds of people that could have put me with as a cellmate, they put me with this Colombian kid. <laughs> and that was Carlos later. Yeah. Wow. Serendipity in the... So, George, why don't you give a little background for, for people that don't know who Carlos Later was? Kid from Columbia, and he grew up, his mother and father split up, and she brought him up in New York City. And but his dad had been a Nazi? Pardon? His dad yeah, had been a Nazi? Nazi. So he was this German-Colombian hybrid, uh, and his mother was a beauty queen from, from Columbia? Yeah, she was beautiful. And then he spent some time in the United States and took a lot a, of time in New York a, City. He went to school in New York City. So he was educated in America and right. then articulate and, and highly intelligent. And he was stealing cars and shipping them to Columbia because the import tax is huge down there on foreign automobiles coming into the country. And they paid off the, the police and they were selling them a Chevy Blazer for like. $60,000, and it was a good business, and it was a federal fence, and that's how he ended up there. And, you know, when you go in a cell with a guy, it's like, what do you do? What are you here for? What you do? You talk. And he, I said, well, I was flying dope, okay, out of Mexico, and... He said, do you have, you have access to airplanes or whatever? He said, do you know anything about cocaine? And I really didn't, okay? And I said, how much does that cost? He said, like five to $10,000 a kilo in Colombia. I said, how much does it cost in the United States? And he said, $60,000. At the top of my head, I said, let's go, baby. <laughs> Let's rock and Rough roll. Yeah. <laughs> and in those days, <clears throat> they didn't have the mandatory sentencing. If you got five years, you did one third and you got parole if it was a nonviolent crime. So we spent the next year and a half plotting and planning. And I got out first, and he got out, he had to go. The immigration, INS, to be deported to Columbia. And I was staying with my mother, and she was, and she said, every other day I want you out of this house. You're a disgrace. And I said, don't worry, I'm leaving. I'm waiting for something. She said, what? I said, a phone call. The phone call came from Columbia. And, and you went down there? Yeah. Uh, it, it, and were you aware while you were in prison the level uh, that of the of the people, the associates that Carlos was keeping in Colombia, not really, because I mean, Pablo Pab Esco, I might as well have been a vacuum cleaner salesman to me. I mean, he was just another Hispanic who was in the drug business because I'd been in Mexico with a lot of other people, okay, Hispanics, and and. I wasn't new to this game with guns and all this and violence mm -hmm. and whatever. And but Pablo Escobar was the, the godfather of cocaine, the most powerful but not uh, dope then kingpin. Not no, right then. at that, right, not that point, but by the mid I eighties, him grow. Right, he became someone that was frequently on the Forbes list for richest men in the world. He was uh, the the most powerful drug boss in a, in, in the entire world. Who do you think let him become that? Boston George. No, no, no. No, I know where he's going with that. That's United States government? Yeah, answer that okay. question. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, let's bring the younger generation up to date. It was a guy named Chapo. I was going to tell people that's the, that's the parallel right now. He was one of the most wanted men in the world. And why was he on the cover of every entertainment magazine in the country and all over the world? in nightclubs walking around totally free with women all over the place or whatever. Why? Because the government wasn't coming after wasn't coming after him at that point. Because in order to be a good guy, you have to have bad guys and vice versa. Someone's gotta be painted as the villain. Right. If there is no villain there can't be any 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 good guys to catch the villain. But for for yeah, for the millennials, uh 
you know, in this day and age, uh, the icon of the drug world is El Chapo. But before there was El Chapo, there was Pablo. Uh, and as the Johnny, Car- uh, Johnny Depp character in the movie Blow says, uh, you know, in case you've been living under a rock for the last 20 years, this, this was the guy, meaning Pablo Escobar. Um, and did you actually get to meet him on that first trip to Colombia? Of course, that's why I went there. So, kind of talk about that, uh, the introduction, and 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 you know, getting with within the proximity that you got uh, from someone that was that he, powerful. But as you said, wasn't that powerful yet? He wanted to know what I could do for him, and I wanted to know what he could do for me. And I told him that I had the expertise to move cocaine out of Colombia in airplanes. To be honest, there wasn't a drug enforcement agency. A lot of people don't even know this until 1974 in this country. And crossing international borders and airplanes was easy, but I didn't tell anybody that. Hmm. Okay. And we were just simply two guys. We went into business. So how long were you in uh, Medellin for that that first trip? I don't know, about five days. And what was what were you guys doing on kind of uh, outside of business? Were you guys socializing? Were you guys going to the clubs? Were you guys just you know every day kind of pounding away at what you were trying to do business wise, or was there some uh, you know some, no, some fun pound, to be had? We pounded away, and I told him how, how I would do it and what have you and everything, and and then of course young men like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So at what point do you, uh, in, in this endeavor, do you meet your, your, your own wife, the beauty queen from- Oh, from, that came. From Columbia. Came years later. Years later? Yeah. So, so you st- what, what year was it when you first met Pablo? What year specifically are we talking about? Oh, that was like about 1972 or three. Okay. Yeah. So right when the cocaine industry was hitting Hollywood and hitting some, some real rich circles, but had not come anywhere near the middle class- um, oh, it didn't come to the middle class for a long time right. because it was $60 a gram. That was a lot of money then. And it was 60,000 a kilo, a thousand kilos. It was only gram. very, very elite, elitist well, type people I that were doing cocaine. had the greatest advertising agency in the world. I had the record industry and I had Hollywood and I had. They made it cool. Yeah. People, people in the suburbs saw people in Hollywood doing it, and they, they wanted to, to mimic right. that and behavior. And it filtered down. That's all. And that so, was the magic. So talk it. about the growth from you know seeing, getting in the, into the cocaine industry really at the ground floor, 1972, 73, and then by the end of the decade, we're in, we're in a full-fledged coke boom, and the United States is you know being, there's a deluge of powder. It wasn't really a deluge of powder. Until, until we got more into the 80s. Until we got more into the 80s, you mean? What happened is that only people that had money did cocaine, even up until the 80s. And then they created a monster called crack. Devastated and destroyed a lot of people's lives. Cheaper version of cocaine that you smoke and uh, filtered down to the the inner cities. Cocaine, you can snort cocaine for two or three, four, five days, okay, and then you can just stop. High is only a shot high, and it's not really super addictive unless you have addictive genes. But they marketed it to to the blacks in this country and pumped the ghettos full of it. And, you know, which is... And then they changed the, the sentencing laws in the United States of America, the federal sentencing laws. I know Jimmy can speak to that from a more kind of a socioeconomic uh, perspective. It was done... You know, for a reason. It was done for a reason, a sick reason. I was in jail with 19-year-old kids that had a handful of rocks that didn't have enough to eat in the, at their own house, okay? And, had, and they would go out and sell the rocks, and like they would give them 25 years in prison, 19-year-old boy. Sometimes you got life. And there, so there was a huge disparity between those... Sentencing the discrepancy that, between powder, right? You know, oh, right? Yeah, and, and rock, and it's powder. evil. Yeah, yeah, that's been a big issue um, for a long time, and, and and even now, powder cocaine is primarily used by affluent people. Right, even right now, it's an expensive. It always has been right commodity. It's been around forever. Right. I mean, yeah, for thousands and thousands of years. And like, right. You know, the best things in life 
go to the richest people in life. Yeah, and you they know. and they get away with it. Well, everybody <laughs> else is worried about, you know, what they're going to eat the next day or how they're going to pay the electric bill. You know, some guy in a penthouse suite in Manhattan is snorting up their whole goddamn life savings, which they'll never make, they'll never see in their whole life anyway. Yeah, in one night. Well, that's why. What I mean, not to digress too much, but something Scott and I talk about is um, one of the reasons why I have a difficult time watching Wolf of Wall Street, even though I appreciate that it's a it's a good movie. Is I I fucking hate those people. I hate <laughs> I hate the Wall Street, the hypocrisy <laughs> of it. <laughs> and so, even though I recognize it's a great film, I just don't I don't like the, the hypocrisy of someone from a lower lower socioeconomic group getting caught with, let's say, rock cocaine, and and they get a you know twenty to life. And, and the hypocrisy of the big shots on Wall Street with the... Well, I hate to say this. <laughs> if I didn't find Carlos and Pablo, I might have been the wolf of Wall Street. Were you aware that there was a political climate emerging in Washington, D.C., with from starting with Nixon and then Ronald Reagan, this war on crime, and well, let's... And let's not just war on crime, create, but specifically a war on drugs. Right, let's create DEA, let's beef it up, and let's go after guys like George Young. Were you aware that there was this we political totally climate? totally aware, I mean, because yeah. they were the enemy. <laughs> and when the enemy puts it on the news every night, what yeah. they're going to do next? Yeah. That was like, thank you, so I guess what you're going to do next. <laughs> yeah. It's got fair warning. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you had to come up with innovative ways to, to avoid, yeah, well, well, to avoid surveillance and and things right. like that, because you had a heads up <laughs> that they were coming yeah. after guys like you. So was was Pablo coming? I know there was there was a part of uh, there was a a point in time where Pablo was actually coming with his family to the United States to vacation. He went anywhere he wanted. Yeah, it was outside the White House. Right. I was say there's that famous yeah, picture right. of him and his kids outside <laughs> right. of the White House. Yeah, I mean, so did you? Did you socialize with Pablo in the United States? Yeah, numerous times. What did you guys do in America when, when he was there? I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> they had coffee. I heard, he, I heard he was more of a guy that liked to smoke pot than actually do uh, cocaine. That he was more of a pothead than a cokehead. No, he, was, he wasn't a super in the drugs. When you, do, when you sell drugs and you move them, and like, you know, it's like... A, you can't own a casino and gamble because you don't own it very long. Mm-hmm. So sum up Pablo's personality. What, what, what made Pablo Pablo? Pablo was an Indian, okay? Like our American Indians, only he was Colombian Indian. 90% of all the arable land in Colombia is owned by 10% of the population. And they were all white Castanians. Didn't matter how much money he had. Because they would never accept him, and the and the more you know rejected he became, he even became on his way to become a state a senator. Yeah, I was say, he 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 was so powerful that he actually personally he infiltrated powerful, the government. He was powerful, but he wasn't. He was feared. And I told him, I said, "Take your money and get the hell out of here, man. Fuck these people. Just go. Forget it. Forget that." Genetic ideology freak show you're on. I said, because I'll never, never accept you. And I drove him, I drove him crazy. It just happens. I mean, he started to the point where he, he was putting hits out on politicians and judges. and But there were a lot of other people who were yeah. making decisions for him, too, okay? You know? but I mean, he was, he was a, uh, an enemy of the state. I mean, it wasn't. You can become a king not knowing that you're a pawn. Yeah, yeah. Expand that. What, who, what do you mean that other people making decisions for him? Who? What? What do you have in mind for that? The wise men make the rules, okay, for the poets and the fools. Mm. Okay, that's the way it always has been, right? Mm-hmm. That's the way it always will be. I mean, look at this country. One percent of the population controls right. the end. All the wealth. One mm-hmm. percent. Mm-hmm. So, do you think that um, Pablo and Carlos had connections to U.S. counterintelligence before Pablo got too big and they and they decided to take him out? I don't think they didn't have access to counterintelligence. They were informed by 
you know, it's always, why is every agency dictative, dictatorial, son of a bitch? Just why do they always begin with three letters? <laughs> CIA. <laughs> the FBI. FBI. Right. <laughs> DEA, FBI, CIA. EPA. <laughs> right. INS. Right. <laughs> we know that during the Cold War that the United States government cozied up to drug lords because the drug lords were useful in neutralizing left-wing opposition groups, peasant groups, unions, things like that. So uh, There was a full-fledged cocaine coup in Bolivia that's in right. 1980. You know that, right. that at one time, the economy of the whole British Empire oh, right. yeah. was based on tea and opium. Opium, right, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. The whole economy. Yeah, the opium wars, right. Yeah. 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 No, so, I, no I, I, it's I been agree. going on for ever and ever. You know, the two most honorable professions in the world are and oldest prostitution mm-hmm. and smuggling. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Smuggling. Yeah. Let's first talk about the romance you had uh, with, with the Colombian beauty queen that we see in the film. <laughs> no, I don't want to. You want to go? You don't want to go into that? The hell with that. <laughs> so that was a bad day at Black Rock. <laughs> okay. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about the uh, Richard Barillo? Um, in the movie, he's called Derek Farrell, is played by Pee Wee Herman. Um, was <laughs> a was a uh, kind of a flamboyant uh, businessman in L.A. that that you guys hooked up with. He was a hairdresser. And he was right. Smart. And he was in, he was a smart drug dealer too. I mean, he was in, doing it long before I got there. So what was his role in, in your business? The girl I was living with, she said, come on, I want to take you to meet somebody. And she was an airline stewardess, okay? And uh, Richard owned a beauty shop, tonsorial hair parlor, and he had nice cars and nice condos and this and that or whatever. And he was, he was affluent. And... I said, what porn? She said, because I'm going to jumpstart your life, going around on the beach buying this and that. And she said, she said, Richard has everything. So we became partners. So it was like taking your business to another level. It's yeah. hooking, hooking up with Richard right. Barillo. And then after I went to jail for the pot and then I got out, called him and I said, I've got something for you, Richard. I hadn't talked to him for a while couple of years and he said what and I said I said just pick me up at the airport in LA tomorrow morning I said I'll be taking the you know the red eye I said I'll be in there and I said don't bring your Porsche I said bring your your suburban so I said I've got some luggage and we got to his house and he said what have you got I said open up the goddamn suitcases he did and then he got a chemist there. We watched it on the thermometer. Another yeah. great scene in the film uh, with Bobcat Goldquaid playing the chemist. Right. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> wow. And it burned at 187, pure. And then they went crazy. And he, he, stuck, he took the suitcases and he said, I'll be back. And I said, okay, I hope so. And he came back with the suitcases full of money and then it was on from there. That was it. And he knew everybody in Hollywood. And it was like a, 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 like a locomotive uh, hurling yeah, down the track. it was tracks. like a meteor streaking through the sky. Let's kind of move to where you have a falling out with Carlos Lader, who was your partner, the uh, guy you hook up with in prison that, that ties you into Escobar's crew, the Medellin, the Medellin cartel. You guys are pumping hundreds and hundreds of kilos uh I would say a week in uh, thousands of kilos, thousands of kilos into the uh, 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 American economy, and at some point, Carlos later kind of goes off the rails. He buys an island out in the Bahamas. Uh, I didn't Nor- want him to buy the island. Norman's Key. Yeah, because my philosophy was keep changing your routes and don't settle into one place where they can lock into you and watch you. Man on the move does not get busted. And then it all fell apart. So he had told you this is what his plan was to kind of take over this island? Yeah. And you were like, that's not a smart idea? It was like some kind of 
Che Guevara mentality. You know? And he, he got kind of strung out on, on the cocaine as well. So he was, I don't know if he was thinking as clear as he had been in the no, past. No, the cocaine made a lot of people crazy. Didn't that, and at one point, Pablo no longer liked what Carlos was doing with the island. Isn't that correct? He was too, maybe generating too much. Um, I mean, the whole goddamn government knew it. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> Everybody was watching. Right. And they just watched and watched. What got Carlos busted, I told him not to hire pilots unless he knew who the fuck they were or where they came from, their background or whatever. And he hired some guy who was an appliance salesman at Sales and Roebuck. Okay, I lived in Jacksonville, Florida. And the guy bought a million-dollar house, and they started looking at him, okay, and spending money. And he's the one who turned Carlos in. Mm. An appliance salesman. <laughs> wow, the, the the downfall of Carlos later from uh, Frigidaire, someone who's uh, yeah <laughs> uh, selling uh, 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 washer dryers. Was there really a uh, an encounter like you see in the film where you go down there and you have a a face to face with later, and he physically assaults you and tells you you're out of the business? He didn't physically assault me. His little body, his, his body, his German bodyguards did. Okay. But, so that really happened, that scene. Yeah, but I didn't care. I just wanted to go there because I knew Carlos. I knew his whole family. I knew his mother, everybody, okay? And like, I knew him in, in prison. And he wasn't, a, he was, let's put it this way, Carlos would have been a one-punch guy at, behind the schoolyard. We'll wrap it up, but let's just real <laughs> quick. <laughs> Quickly talk You're about... You're not a wrap-it-up guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you tell that to my, my producer and my editors. They all will agree with you. Anything real quick, anything you want to uh, let people know about, uh, about you know, where they can find you, anything you're doing that you want people to know about? Well, I'm not too big on the internet or whatever, but maybe if Rhonda wants to step over here for a minute... And the beautiful, lovely, talented Rhonda will uh, yeah, let everyone know where we can, can find me. Can find George Young on so social media. I don't know my address. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On Facebook, it's um, there's a couple Boston George official sites, and then the, there's a docu series coming out too. Nice. And you can go on YouTube and look up Boston George famous without the fortune and see part of the docu-series, the trailer. Thank you so much, George, and we will see you next time on the OG Podcast.